Hello, my name is Aaron Snow, and in this video, we're going to talk about love. We're not talking about um, natural love or the love between a man and a woman. We're not talking about an infatuation, but we're talking about real, true, blue love. And real love has to do with giving your life for somebody else. It's the it would cause you to do that if it, if necessary. Real love is when you value somebody else as having more value than yourself. And uh, this is that's that perfect love, in which you, uh, which you know, you, you might want to live yourself, but if somebody like your child or something like that is is um, is there's a possibility of real danger that they may be killed or that they're going to be killed, you'd rather yourself to be cast into the fire than for them to be destroyed, you know. And so that's what perfect love is all about. And of course, we're getting, we'll get deeper into it, what it really means and the implications. Because to me, well, I say to me, but ultimately love is the most single most important thing in the scriptures. I mean, it is so important that if you understand love, and I'm getting ahead of myself, you understand perfection. If you have love in you, then you're going to be perfected. And you're going to be perfect in every possible way. You may not be the well-dressed, you may, may not have the prettiest face, but that has nothing to do with, with a true blue beauty. Love causes beauty to happen. <laughs> Love causes you to not sin and not walk in the flesh. Love causes you to be an overcomer. Love is like the ultimate weapon of sat against Satan. I mean, it's like perfect. And uh, the whole scriptures and everything written is about love. And now I'm making this bold statement because it's a true statement. And I'm going to read the scriptures that teach this and show this. Number one scripture is, the, uh, is Matthew 7 and 12. And it talks about the golden rule. And it says, To do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And I'll read this. Matthew 7 and 12. And it says, and of course, in, this is the today's English version Bible. So, you know, you follow, follow along in the King James Version if you can. But it says here, Matthew 7 and 12, it says, uh, do, do for others what you would want them to do for you. It says, for this is the meaning of the law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets. Now think about that. There's two parts to that. The first part, it just basically says that do unto others. In this case, it says, do for others what you would want them to do unto you. So if you want somebody to give you honor, what do you do? Well, you do to them what you would want them to do to you. You give them honor. If you want people to bless you, you bless them. If you want people to help you, you know, if you're, you're carrying uh, groceries and you need help carrying groceries and you would want people to help you, next time you see somebody carrying groceries that are having a hard time, you see that they are in need, go help them. If somebody's on the side of the road, they just ran out of gas, you know that there's real trouble there, that they need help. You know, it's not a trap. It's not tra somebody trying to, you know, trap you, but it's actually somebody who's in real need. And you would want somebody to help you, so you go and help them. You do unto others as you would have others do unto you. This is the golden rule. And it says here that it is the, the meaning. This is the meaning of the law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets. It is the fulfillment of the law and of the teaching of the prophets. Everything written in the Old Testament, all the laws and all the prophets are fulfilled in that scripture. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Now this is just one scripture, but we're moving on from there. We're going to establish what I'm talking about. In Matthew, in the... Uh, the 22nd chapter, and uh, I guess it's technically, it starts in the 34, 34th verse, and I'll read start, or the, um, I say the 36th verse, it, it technically starts in the 34th verse, but I'll start with the 36th. It says, teacher, he asked, which is the greatest commandment in the law? That means we're talking about the law of all the commandments ever written. In the Old Testament, which is the greatest of the commandments? It says, Jesus answered, it says, Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, I see, um, with, with, 
Let's see, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest, and it's the most important commandment. The second most important commandment is like it. It says, love your neighbor as you, would, as you love yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. It says, the whole law of Moses, the whole law of Moses, and the teachings of the prophets depend on these two commandments. To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and to love thy neighbor as thyself. That is the fulfillment and the fulfilling of all the commandments ever written. I've seen people, you know, even church-going people that did not quite understand that and it's and, and exactly what it means. But we're going to keep going on. We're going to do better than most of the church people out there to get further along here. And uh, Romans, the chap, uh, 13th chapter of Romans, starting with the 8th verse. That's Romans 13 and 8. It says, Be under obligation to no one. The only obligation you have is to love one another. That's the only thing you're obligated to do is to love one another. Whoever does this has obeyed the law. You have obeyed it when you love one another. That's what it's saying. It says, now the commandments, it says, do not commit adultery. It says, do not murder. Do not steal. Do not desire what uh, belongs to someone else. It says, all these, all these commandments that are written here, so all the law, all the law that's written, all the commandments, says, and any other besides are summed up in one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. It just plainly says it. If you love others, you will never do them wrong. It says, love seeketh no ill will toward its neighbor. It says, it says then love, it says, is to obey the whole law. It says, uh, therefore, love is, is the fulfilling of the law. So I kind of remember both what the King James Version said and what this says. But it says, uh, love seeketh no ill will toward its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Therefore, if you love, you are going to keep those commandments, not because you were just told to do it, but because it's a natural thing for you to do. Because you love your neighbor, you're not going to steal and rob him blind. Because you love your neighbor, you're not going to sit there and curse him out. <laughs> you know, if you love your neighbor, you're not going to try to murder him or his children. If you love your neighbor, you're going to try to do good, basically. And that's what it's talking about. It's a natural fulfillment of the law and the prophets are fulfilled in that scripture. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Um, we go on. Let's see here. We'll read this right here. It's the uh, the 13th chapter of First Corinthians. First Corinthians 13, starting with the the first verse. The whole chapter is about love. It's uh, and you read it in the King James version. It's talking about charity, and charity in this case means love. It's it's a uh, you know some kind of Greek word that means love. It's just pure love. That's the love we're talking about. Um, the first verse, it says, says, I may be able to speak the languages of human beings and even of angels. Said, and the King James, King James Version says, Though I speak with the tongues of men or the tongues of angels. It says, But if I have no love, if I don't have charity, if I don't have love, my speech is no more than a noisy gong or a clinging bell. Though I'm able to speak other languages, even the languages of angels, if I don't have love, it's nothing. That's what that means, a clanging gong or, or a, 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 bang, a noisy gong or clean, clanging bell. It says, I may have the gift of inspired preaching. I may have all knowledge. Now get this, I may have all knowledge and understanding of all secrets. I may have all the faith needed to move mountains. But if I have no love, I am nothing. That means, you know, you're able to understand everything and you're able to overcome with all strength, you know, and faith to do anything, yet you have no, no love, you're considered to have nothing. You have nothing. 
Remember, I, everything is pale in comparison to love. It says, I may give away everything I have and even give my body to be burned. But if I have no love, this does me no good. It doesn't profit me one ounce. And it says, love is patience. Patient. Remember, you see somebody in need, you you, you got to be patient with them, right? You want them to be saved. You want them to do good. And, and they're acting destructive. And they're, they're having a hard time. They're being mean to you. But you're sitting there having patience and waiting. It says, love is patient. And it's kind. Says it is not jealous or conceited or proud. It's not full of himself. You know, one of the essential parts about pride is that you're honoring yourself because you think yourself is so wonderful. In fact, pride is the exact opposite of love. And and pride, you value yourself as more uh, valuable than anybody else. In love, you're valuing everybody else as more valuable than yourself. It's the exact opposite going on here. You're not conceited or proud. Love is not ill-mannered. It treats others right. It's not, you know, brutish or anything. It's not selfish, it says, or selfish or irritable. It's not easily provoked. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. It doesn't sit there and think, you know, oh, so-and-so did this and so-and-so did that, and, and you're sitting there just wanting to rub it in and wanting them to be destroyed. Love doesn't want other people to be destroyed. It doesn't bring up things like that. Love is not happy with evil, but it is happy with the truth. Love never gives up. It says it is, um, and its faith, hope, and patience never fails. It never gives up. Love never gives up on somebody. Somebody's in need. There's some issues going on, and and and. and you know, there's actually more to it than that. I, I'd like to get into a deeper part of that, perhaps in another video about love. But it never gives up. It's full of faith, hope, and patience. Um, it never That never fails. It says, love is eternal. It says, there are, then it goes, he breaks into something here. He starts talking about something a little bit different. It says, now there are inspired messages. Paul is speaking here. There are inspired messages, um, but they are temporary. It says, there are gifts of speaking in strange tongues, but they will cease. There is knowledge, but it will pass away. It says, for our gifts of knowledge and of inspired messages are only partial. And it says about these messages that he gives, and that his ability to speak in other tongues, and that and that uh, the gifts of knowledge that he has received and been blessed with, he said these are only partial gifts. These are only just like in between things. They're not quite full. That's what he's saying here. He said, but, but when what is perfect comes, then what is partial will disappear. He's talking about something perfect. What is this perfect thing that supersedes and is greater than preaching and greater than than tongues and greater than knowledge. What is this special perfect thing? It says, when I was a child, my speech, um, feelings, and thinking were all those of a child. See, I was partial. See, when, when I was a child, my speech, feelings, and thinking were all those of a child. Now that I am an adult, I have no more use of childish ways. Uh, when we see now, I said, what we see now is like a dim image in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. What no I say what I know now is only partial, but it will but it will be complete as complete as God God's knowledge of me. It says, Meanwhile, there are three remain faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Now what he's talking about, these partial things that are not nearly complete. But then he just got through talking about love, how it's perfect in every possible way, <laughs> and that it is complete. And so we are trying to get what he's kind of hinting at is that we're, even though we have all these wonderful messages, we have all this faith, we have this understanding opened up to us, love is better than that. Love is even better than that. We have partial knowledge, we have partial things, 
tongues cease, you know, everything falls apart, everything has a limit, but love has no limits. Love is perfect. It goes on to perfection. Now, to really complete this idea, complete, uh, to really truly understand love itself, why is it so perfect? Why is it the complete result? Why is it the fulfillment of all the laws and commandments? Well, we have to understand something very important about love. And it's in the first, uh, first John, you know, you have St. John, and you have John the Revelator in Revelations, but we're talking about 1 John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. But 1st John, in the 4th chapter, starting with the 7th verse. It says, Dear friends, let us love one another, we're talking about love again, because love comes from God. What? You mean love doesn't come from man? You mean men don't really love each other? Well, apparently not. Because it says love comes from God. It's, ex it's inclusive. It's just stating it as a matter of fact. Whoever loves is a child of God and knows God. So love is intimately linked with God somehow or another. We're going to find out how in a minute. It says whoever loves is a child of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. For God is love. It didn't just have, he did, doesn't just have love. It says God is love. And it confirms this later on too. Love is not just an emotion. In this case, it's, it's a, a personality. It's, a, it's like a, the, uh, the center of all things. God is love. If we have God, then we have love. And he dwells in us. And that's what it's going to say here in a minute. It says, and God showed his love for us by sending his son into the world so that we might have life through him. This is what love is. It is not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the means by which our sins are forgiven. It says, dear friends, if this is how God loved us, then we should love one another. See, if God loved us in so much that he gave his, you know, life for us that he sent his son to give his life for us if you will you know the way he's putting it it says no one has ever let uh, see uh dear friends if this is how god loved us then we should love one another okay no one has ever seen god but if we love one another god lives in union with us in the king james version it says god lives in us just point blank says but if we love one another god lives in us and we and his love is made perfect in us so it's it's uh um but if we love one another it's saying here god is in union with us and he dwells in us and his love is perfected in us we are sure that we live in union with god and that he lives in union with us because he has given us given us of his spirit his spirit is a verification. His spirit apparently is love in this case. And we have seen and tell others that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If we declare that Jesus is the Son of God, we live in union with God, and God lives in union with us, and we ourselves know and believe the love which God has for us. And then it goes on and says, for God is love. God is love. That's what it says here. And those who live in love live in union with God. And God lives in union with them. Love is made perfect in us in order that we may have courage on the day of judgment. And we have it because our lives in this world is the same as Christ's. There is no fear in love, for perfect love drives out all fear. So then love has not been uh, love has not been made perfect in anyone who is afraid. If you have fear, that means you don't have love in you. That's what it's saying. Because fear has to do with punishment. We're not talking about the fear of God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. You know, it's an essential part to be in respect of God and to fear God and to do what he says, you know, to humble yourself before God. That's a different sort of a situation there. We're talking about regular fear, fear of the punishment. 
You have nothing to be afraid of when you have love because there is no punishment for someone who walks in love. It says for it says we love it's nineteenth verse. We love God. I said we love because God first loved us, and if we love God, but hate others. Um, let's see, yeah. If we say we love God, but hate others, we are liars. For we cannot love God, um, whom we have not seen, if we do not love others whom we have seen. The commandment that Christ has given us is this: Whoever loves God must love others also. Now I'll repeat this again: If we say we love God but hate others, we are liars. <laughs> We are liars, for we cannot love God, whom we have not seen, if we do not love others whom we have seen. So if you're doing evil to others, and you're destroying others, and you're lying and stealing and murdering and pillaging to others, and and uh, you see they have need and you don't help them, um, love of God is not in you, and then you sit there and say that you're a child of God, you're a liar. You're a liar, because you cannot possibly be a child of God. You can't possibly have God's spirit in you because you don't love one another. That's how. That's why I'm saying that, that this love that we're talking about is so immensely important. At the beginning of this video, I, I, I said that, that, that it's the end all say all. If you have this love in you, you have God in you. And that's why the commandments were written in that way because that is the mind of Christ. That is God. That's him. He has love toward you, and he wrote those commandments with that in his mind because that's who he is. And when people speak, they speak out of the abundance of the heart. You know, as the scripture says, out of, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Well, out of the abundance of God's heart came the commandments. And if what was in him was based in love, then what come out of his mouth was based in love. And the commandments was about treating others right. And not only of those main commandments, we speak of Ten Commandments, but of also all these other ideas. You know, when somebody's in need and we see that they're in need and we don't have c compassion on them and we don't try to help them and we, and we you know, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. If we don't fulfill that, then we don't have God working in our lives and we are breaking his commandments. And if we then say that we're children of God, we are made liars. Because we are not, and we cannot be, if we have that in us. And that's the, the, the uh, end all say all, exact definitions here. You know, it's a, a perfect thought. It is a complete idea. It's not partial. You know, it's a fulfillment. It's a fulfilling of everything. And I appreciate you guys for listening. Hopefully you didn't get too lost. And really, it, is, it even gets deeper than this. Because, you know, it, there's a lot to say about uh, the personality of God when it, when it comes down to it. You, you can learn an awful lot, but this is really a basic lesson. This is the beginning of things. And I appreciate you guys for listening. I, hopefully I'll get another video out soon, and um, we'll see. Peace out. Later. <laughs>